Good morning. Good morning to each and every one of you. Uh, many of you in here this morning, I know, uh, from my days of preaching at Starkville Community Church. Some of you I don't know, but I look forward uh, to getting to know you, to Brother Grant, <clears throat> to uh, Brother Joe. He told me a few moments ago he wanted me to start calling him Joe, but it just don't sound right. It just, I don't know, I just can't bring myself to just say Joe. just can't say it, so Brother Joe. And so to the official staff that make up uh, this great church, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. And my name is Brian Hood, uh, the lead pastor for uh, Community Point Baptist Church there in Hernando, uh, Mississippi. And let me say, before I get started, let me say thank you. Thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you, because I couldn't be what I am. Our church family, our church plant could not be what it is without people like you who constantly are praying for us, who thinks about us and encourages us, uh, us along the way. So again, let me say thank you uh, so much uh, for that. Now, Brother Joe told me to take as much time as I need to. So uh, about four o'clock this evening, <laughs> we will be getting out of here. No, I'm just playing. But I dare not, I dare not tarry long. The Bible said that laughter is good for the soul. And if you can't smile every once in a while, God did not design it for us to frown up all the time and, and to be like a sour lemon. So uh, Acts chapter 9. We'll get right into the, today's sermon. Acts chapter 9. And I've been asked to do verses 32 through 43. Now, I know you have your series that you're dealing with as you're going through uh, the book of Acts. Uh, but if you will allow me just for these few moments this morning, i just like to tag on just a little bit of a subject to this as well. And I truly believe it will go along with what you have been um, studying, what you've, what's being preached to you and everything. But we're going to be dealing with this church that has a heart, a church with a heart here in the book of Acts chapter 9, and when you look at verses 32 through 43, a church with a heart. And so when you found Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through 43, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version, you'll find these said words. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda, and there he found a certain man named Aeneas, um, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise, make your bed. And then he arose immediately. And so all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In verse 36, at Joppa there was a certain disciple uh, named uh, Tabitha, which is translated Dor Dorcas. And this woman was full of good works, charitable deeds, which she did. But it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. And then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all out and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, rise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Then he gave, uh, then he gave her his hands and lifted, lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. In verse 43, so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon Atana. Again, God's word for God's people and God's word is already blessed uh, this morning. So, again, I want to look at just for a few moments this church with a heart. This church with a heart. Now, make no mistake about it. 
Anywhere you go, as you go up and down the highways and byways, yes, you will see buildings with steeples and even crosses and groups of people who call themselves a church. And yet, brothers and sisters, I want to make sure that I implore to you that I inform you, that I even remind some of you this morning, not everybody who comes together, whether it's inside of a building, outside of a building, or has a steeple, not every body is a church. And definitely not every group that comes together is a church with a heart this morning. And yet when we look at the early church this morning, when you think about the early church and all that the early church has had to go through, has had to deal with, will continue to deal with as you go through the book of Acts. We see here in these verses this morning, we notice here a new ministry. We see how caring and compassionate that this early church was. And it was truly a church with a heart. And so there's three things here that the author tries to unpack in the text this morning when we talk about uh, what constitutes a church with a heart. The first thing we notice here this morning when you think about this church with a heart. The early church, it had a heart for humans. It had a heart for humans. And I tell uh, Community Point every Sunday and every chance that I get to preach. And not only Community Point, but I've been in ministry about 30 years now. Been a senior pastor for about 16 of those 30 years. And constantly, every time I'm in front of people and the Lord allow me to be in front of people, and I tell people time and time again, we are in the people business. We're in the people business. There's a lot of things that we will do. There's a lot of things that we may have our hands in on a given basis. And yet, at the end of the day, we are in the people business. And when you look here at the early church, this early church here, it had a heart for humans. This early church, they cared about people. They cared about people. Not only did they care about people, but they were just not a mass of people, even though many were being saved. Yes, there was a lot of people, and yes, there was a lot of people being saved. There was a lot of things going on at this day and time, and in spite of all the things that was going on, yet they had a heart for people. And Bridgeway, this morning, there's a lot of things that may be going on in your community. There's a lot of things that you may be doing this summer. You may have your hands in this, have your hands in that. You may find yourselves wearing a lot of hats. But it is my prayer that each and every one of you, as you're doing this, as you're doing that, never lose sight in having a heart for people. And not only just people, not just people that you know, but even the people that you don't know. Yes, if they're saved, praise God and hallelujah. But even those who are not saved and who don't know God and who are far away from God, it is my prayer this morning that you, just like the early church here in the text this morning, have a heart for people. Look how the author takes time to show us some real people. Not only real people, but real people with real names, with real feelings, and real needs. Now again, I believe that's worth saying one more time because I believe sometimes we forget about that as a church if we're not careful. That we can get so busy, that we can get so bogged down in doing this and that, running here, running there, wearing this hat and wearing that hat, that we forget. Again, that we should be in the people business, that we sometimes forget that we are dealing with real people, with real names, with real feelings, and they have real needs this morning. And yet, when you look at verse 32 this morning, when you start out in verse 32, look how God is doing a great work in Peter this morning. Look how God is dealing with Peter's heart this morning. Again, Peter is somebody here, he's no stranger. Peter is one who is rough around the edges. Peter is one, uh, when he's in a certain setting, he's one thing. And when he's in another setting, he's something else. And Paul himself, he had to call Peter out on this. And again, I pray this morning, brothers and sisters, that we are not like that. And if you're not careful, this is why it's so important that we have to stay rooted in the Word of God. 
we have to stay humble because if not, we can find ourselves being one thing with this group and being something else with this group here. But when you look at the text this morning, God is doing a work in Peter's heart this morning. Remember Peter at once upon a time. Remember that Peter has been thinking that the gospel is only for the Jews. And yet, look what God is doing here in the text this morning. Look how God sends Peter here to this majority Gentile city here this morning. And God begins to break down the walls of prejudice in Peter's heart. And he learns what Galatians 3 and 28 tells us. That there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. God loves people. And I want to make sure that you understand that this morning, Bridgeway, that God loves people. And not only does God love people, but God loves you and I this morning. He loves us this morning. And brothers and sisters, we are more than just a number to God. Many of our churches this morning, they are packed this morning. People after people, car after car, and we come in. And in many of our places of worship, we are only known by numbers. But that's not so with the Lord. That you are more than just a number this morning. And I pray that as you continue to deal with people, I pray that as you pray that God send people in your path, that you remind them no matter what season of life they may find themselves in, they are more than just a number this morning. When you look at verses 33 and 35 this morning, you, you see Aeneas here. The Bible tells us that he has been crippled. Not only has he been crippled, but he's been crippled for eight years. And yet at this particular moment, at this particular time, he was healed. And in the midst of many being saved, and I want you to think about this, Many are being saved at this particular moment, at this particular time. And yet, God knew about this one man. God knew about this one man with real needs. And God met his needs. And brothers and sisters, I'm so thankful for that this morning. I am truly thankful for that this morning. Because there have been times in my life, in my life, where I've had needs. I needed somebody to talk to. And people that cared about me, those who didn't even care about me. Sometimes if you're not careful, we can get so wound up and consumed in our own little world that we forget about others, that we forget that we're not the only one with needs, but there's somebody else, not only that have needs, but sometimes their needs are much greater than ours. And yet, what you see going on here, this man who's been crippled for eight years, and there's a lot that's going on, and yet in the midst of all of this, a real man with real needs, and God knew about this one man, and God knows about you this morning. I don't care what Satan tells you. I don't care what the world tells you. I don't care what season of life you're in this morning. And I know sometimes the road can get lonely. Sometimes the journey can get lonely. Sometimes you feel discouraged. Sometimes you walk away, you're shaking your head, and I want to remind you, I want to encourage you this morning that God knows about you. God not only knows about you, but he knows your situation, just as he knew about this man's situation in the text this morning. So everything that was going on, and yet God knew about him, God met his needs, and God will meet your needs this morning. God will truly meet your needs. And I pray that you will share that and continue to share that with others as God put people in your path and as he put people in my path. Not only will God, God met this man's need, but God cares and God knows where not only that this man lives, but God knows where you live. God knows where you live this morning. And again, I'm glad about that because there are times when I have been in need and I've called people and the voicemail comes up. There are times, if you're like myself, have you ever had people that tell you, brother, if you need anything, or sister, if you need anything, just give me a call. And then when you're really in need of something, and I'm not just talking about material things, but it could be a word of encouragement, or just you need to vent, or whatever the case may be. And I've gone to pick up the phone, or I try to email, and some of those same people have gone into the witness protection program. 
even as a church planner, I've had people that say, I'll support you, Brother Brian. I'm with you all the way. And when I turn around and I look back, a lot of times, brothers and sisters, it's lonely. A lot of times, those same people will not pick up the phone. And it doesn't mean that they're mean. It's just sometimes they get wound up and they get so consumed in what they have going on that it's easy to forget that there are real people out there that have real needs. And yet, I'm glad that God knows where we live, that God knows our situation, and that he cares. And so, not only when we look at the text this morning that we see a church with a heart, and we see that the early church had a heart for people or for humans, but the next thing here this morning I want to show you in the text, beginning with verse 36 through 38. Look how the early church had a heart for helping. So we move from the early church having a heart for humans, and now the early church has a heart for helping. Now again, remember what I said earlier. We are in the people business. And if you're not, you, you're already behind the eight ball if you're not in the people's business this morning. So the early church has a heart for helping. Notice here, notice ab about this particular person here. Notice about Tabitha. Look at the demonstration of faith and power here in the text this morning. And not only the demonstration of power and faith, but it's much deeper than that. Because it's continued proof that God cares about people. Yes, we know about this lady. Yes, we, we know about her gifts. Yes, the Lord, the Lord, he knew her needs. God knew this lady's needs. He knew where she was. And not only that, but he met those needs. And this is the thing that I'm so glad about. And I'm going to talk about this in just a few moments, about her deeds and the things that she did for the community, how the community responded when they found out that she had left and everything had gone on. But when you think about John 10 and 27, when we think about how the Lord loves us, how he cares about us, how he will meet our needs, John 10 and 27 tells us, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. There we go again with that common denominator. I know them. Brothers and sisters, again, no matter if the lights are turned off in your life right now, no matter what darkness you may find yourself in, God knows you. And he said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. John 10 and 14 says, I am the good shepherd. Know my sheep, and I am known of mine. There we go again that, with that same common denominator. Time and time again, as you read through the text, as you read through Scripture, God knows you. Whether you're sitting at the front pew or you're sitting way in the back, or if you're outside of the building this morning, if you're on the internet, wherever you are, know that God knows where you're at, and God, he cares about you this morning. And yet, we're dealing with Tabitha here this morning. Yet, she had made such an impact on our community. Her gift, her talents that the scripture talks about, and how she used those gifts and those talents for the people that she knew and she loved and that she cared about. Yes, she used her gifts. Yes, she used her talents to bless others. Yes, she sold a lot of things. What did she sow? I really don't know, but what I do know, she sold what they needed. Not only that, brothers and sisters, but I want you to think about this. This lady here with her talents, with her gifts, and how she used it for the community. If you're going to be a church with a heart, brothers and sisters, your gifts, your talents... What are you doing with your gifts? What are you doing with your talents this morning? I pray that nobody is having to beg you to sign a sheet to do kingdom work. Because I tell people this all the time. It's amazing to me how we talk about how much we truly love God. That we are a church. That we're serving the Lord. And yet, time and time and time again, church after church after church. I see people, I see staff standing up, literally begging the children of God to sign a list to serve. Now, I want you to think about that for a few moments. 
If you just do me just a favor, would everybody just look around just for a few moments? Just look around for just a few moments. If you can, we got some people way up here in the, in the balcony too. God bless you. Hi. Now, I said all of that to say this. That as many people as I am looking at down here and up there, there should never be a time where somebody have to stand up and say, we need somebody to sign up to work with the children. We need somebody to sign up and do this. We need somebody to do this and do that. There ought to be a doorbuster of people just running up saying, where can I serve? My gifts, my talents, when you look at this lady here in the text, when you think about a church with a heart, and if you're truly going to be a church with a heart, brothers and sisters, you've got to be using your talents that God has blessed you with for kingdom's sake. And here's the thing about it. She did a lot of stuff here in the text. She did a lot of stuff, and she made a great impact. And you may be sitting in your seat this morning saying, well, I can't do this like this person, and I can't do that like this person. And you don't have to do that. I want you to think about a paper clip this morning. Think about how small a paper clip is. It's really small. Just a small piece of metal. And yet, when you think about what a paper clip is able to do, hold a lot of papers together. Can do a lot of things. And here's the thing. It's not about the size. It's not about the width. It's not about how long it is. What's really important about that paper clip is how it's bent. <laughs> That's why I can get the job done the way it does. It's how it's bent. And here's my question to you this morning. You don't have to sing like Joe. You don't have to sing like Grant. You don't have to do what others are doing. But how are you bent this morning? How are you bent? So yes, this lady, she had gifts. Yes, she had talents. And yes, she used it to bless others. And yes, at the same time, you may not have the flashiest of abilities. You may not be able to sing like others. You may not be able to teach the exact same way but with others. But how do you use those gifts to help people this morning? How are you using your gift to help people? If we are truly in the people business, if we are truly a church with a heart this morning. Yes, we laugh together. Yes, we cry together for God's glory. And a church with a heart has a heart for helping. It has a heart for helping. You should have a heart for helping people this morning. But not only have we looked at a church that helps humans or has a heart for humans, a church that has a heart for helping, but here's the last thing that the author wants us to understand as I try to unpack this in these next uh, few moments. The early church had a heart for heaven. The early church had a heart for helping, or heaven I should say. Yes, it had a heart for humans. Yes, it had a heart for helping. But now when we look at the text this morning, now we see that the early church had a heart for heaven. And I pray that each and every one of you, whether you're sitting here again and you're up there or you're listening in this morning, I pray that you have a heart for heaven this morning. Look at the results of these miracles. As you go back through the text and you read about each miracle this morning, when you look at Aeneas here, he was healed. And the Bible said not only was he healed, but notice people turned to the Lord and people got saved. Notice Tabitha, yes, was risen from the dead. People saw what the church was doing. And at the same time, people got saved. Again, this church with a heart. This church with a heart had a heart for heaven. And brothers and sisters, if all we are are programs and events, and again, I want to make sure that you understand this morning, programs and events are all right in their prospective place. But if that's the only thing that defines you and I, if that's the only thing that we use to, if that's going to be our strategy of the day, and if that's going to be the strategy that wins the day, and if all we are are programs and events, 
and we don't focus on getting people saved, then we're just making the world a better place to go to hell from. If we don't evangelize, we will fossilize. I want you to think about that for just a few moments. If we are not evangelizing this morning, we will fossilize. And brothers and sisters, there's enough fossils out there already in the ground. There's enough people, uh, scientists, and trying to take dust and sand and putting it off. We don't need that here in the church. We don't need that among the saints of God. And so I tell them at Community Point that if you're going to evangelize, you need to evangelize where you live, where you play, where you work, and even where you worship. And my question to you this morning, where you live at, are you evangelizing? Your neighbors, the people down the street, are you evangelizing? Where you work, are you evangelizing? Where you play? And I've had people ask, well, why will you play? Because every time you go past a baseball field, football field, there are more cars there than there is on a church parking lot on any given Sunday morning. So since you're going to be out there anyway, are you evangelizing? And even where you worship, are you evangelizing? Because if you are not evangelizing, then all you're doing is fossilizing. And if we can help meet people's physical needs, praise God. Praise God that you are able. Praise God that I am able from time to time to help meet the physical needs of people. But we must, at the end of the day, see their main need. And everybody's main need, whether they want to admit it or not, is Jesus Christ. And in conclusion, as I get ready to wrap up this sermon, as I come to my close this morning, our greatest need is a spiritual healing. Our greatest need is a spiritual healing through the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. We can offer culture, and there's a lot of churches that offer culture this morning, but without Christ, we just produce dignified lost people. There's a lot of churches that offer education, and while education is okay in this perspective place, but if that's all that you offer, then you end up producing enlightened lost people. There's a lot of churches that offer religion this morning, and it's okay again in its perspective play. But if that's all that we offer, we end up producing religious lost people this morning. I pray this morning, brothers and sisters, and again, I'm done this morning. But I pray, I pray that God helps us to be this better church, this church with a heart, a heart for humans, for helping, but most of all, a heart for heaven. God bless you this morning and God keep you is my prayer. Let us pray.